Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the urban planning session. And um, welcome to the session that is focusing not only on urban planning, but how data are revolutionized the ways that we plan our cities. So we live in a world of cities, but we also live um, in cities of ubiquitous connectivity. The amount of data that they are available um, through networks uh, and sensors, they are about 30 uh, million uh, globally. And this number is about to increase by 30% uh, per year. So at the same time, what we see is that cities evolve faster than ever, facing uh, challenges of sustainability, but also challenges of social participation within their planning. Now, data are there to help us face those challenges. Uh, data are there to help us uh, monitor the performance of our infrastructures. They are there to help us be the base to take more um, accurate uh, decisions in planning. Now, I am an architect and I am an urban planner. And a few years ago, we, until a few years ago, we were designing and we were planning with one, approximate data, which means speculative data on, for example, population or mobility. And two, we were planning and designing with CAD files, with colored maps and, and zoning maps. Now, today, we use different kind of tools. You, we use tools of uh, GIS, which stands for Geographical Information Systems, and we are able to actually be able to overlap data in order to have uh, conclusions, but also overlap existing uh, projects with projected ones. And that help us to really plan in a very different and radical way. Now, beyond the GIS, and beyond the urban analytic tools through cloud computing, we have also different kind of sophisticated algorithms that either through machine learning or uh, statistic analytics, they help us to actually transform data, which by the way, they are just values, they are just numbers. They are actually helping us to transform those values into uh, information. And this information can help us to take smarter actions in the city, which are for the best of the communities. And all this sounds pretty promising, doesn't it? Now the question is whereas data itself uh, is enough in order to allow us to plan in a more uh, different and, and um, uh, radical way. Uh, owning the data, we know very well that most of the times means owning certain power. So uh, this also makes it imperative to talk about the networks of data, the nature of the networks of our data. And of course, uh, this is where we uh, um, actually start to be introduced into new ideas about open networks and uh, data networks that they are more transparent and they are also um, allowing us to share data in a better way. Now, our speakers today will go deep in explaining uh, how these database new tools can radically change the way we plan our cities. Through specific case studies, they will go through the immense potential of database planning, but they will also speak about certain limitations. So can all cities adapt uh, these new ways at ease, with no difficulty, and with no any lateral losses? Those are some of the questions that we will be dealing with with our speakers. And of course, the crucial question of who owns the data. Um, and this is why, as said before, uh, being more open and transparent, not only on the data themselves, but also on the networks of how we exchange them becomes very, very fundamental. Now, our first speaker for today is gonna be Rufus uh, Pollock. Mr. Uh, Rufus is a researcher, technologist, and an entrepreneur. He's the founder and president of uh, Open Knowledge which is a leading international platform that empowers people and organizations, giving them access to information, but also the skills in order to work with this info uh, and make sense of it. Uh, Rufus will speak about the necessity of open platforms for big data and the implications, or better said, the limitations, and he is now coming with us, of uh, artificial intelligence and robots uh, and robotic algorithms in the information age. So please help me welcome Rufus on stage. Uh, Rufus, thank you. Can I, uh, can I put this here? Sure, have you can. Have you got a slide with my name or not? Do you know what yes, we have. Is that visible? That's correct. 
presentation of Ruth. Okay. Um, there's no specific presentation, just a slide with my name. No, no, that's what I was saying. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. And, you know, maybe in a representation of smart city stuff, you can see there's been a, you're getting me first today because I think there was some issue with taxi lo routing. So there's still some old technology out there that, that had some difficulties this morning uh, for my fellow speaker. So I'm actually, so first of all, I want to do, I'm going to do a couple of things. It's going to be a slightly different maybe presentation from normal. So um, first, I want to introduce myself to you all this morning. So my name is Rufus Pollock. Uh, I'm the founder of Open Knowledge, Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, I'm also uh, the creator of something called CCAN, which is a data platform used by hundreds of cities uh, and governments around the world to manage their public, certainly their open data. Um, and I am now the CEO of Viderum and uh, Open Knowledge's kind of CCAN development system. So um, uh, I've had op now about n over 15 years of working to use data with government, cities, for-profits, non-profits to deliver value, to create insight. And particularly in the last decade, I've been very uh, active in the open data space. And Viderum, which I just mentioned, is a company which is dedicated to helping cities, governments, and others publish data, use data, gain insight. And it's Viderum that along with 27 other partners uh, is part of the next GEOS consortium, which is a Horizon 2020 funded project, which is looking at how we can use all of this different sensor data that we are now collecting, particularly from satellites, which is often open data already in the EU, how we can um, use that data and make it more available uh, and actually make it connect that data which is being collected with the researchers, the entrepreneurs, and others who want to actually turn it into applications that are useful. So to give you a sense, obviously, there's now a lot of satellite data, and it's been a big thing in the, the kind of big data discussion of the last three to five years or longer of how we can start using sensing data to tell us things that we otherwise had to guess before. So for example, one of the projects in NextGeos is looking at using data on crops, uh, you know, satellite imagery of fields at very low resolution to basically up yields in crops by 10 or 15% by using that information to give uh, advice, prediction to farmers on how to use it. Or for example, we're able to use satellite imagery to tell us about air pollution in cities. Um, now, one of the things that I think that there's this huge potential, and normally I'm not showing you slides today, but normally what I would show you, which would be exciting, would be a visualization or some other sexy thing showing the results. But actually what I want to talk to you a lot about today, a little bit is what I call the iceberg problem. So I've done quite a lot of work with consulting uh, in, our, in Viderum and elsewhere over the last decade, and certainly over the last few five years especially, people, you know, predictive analytics, machine learning, AI, et cetera. And in, you know, working with companies from Fortune 500 to cities to NGOs. Now, what you find, I would say, almost all of the time is the actual, the actual regression or the actual visualization at the end takes you probably less than 10% of the effort of the project. I mean, I, I studied maths at Cambridge, so I was a mathematician, so I love, I love fancy uh, algorithms. But you know the irony? Most of the time, it's a regression that you do in, you can do in high school at the end of this stuff, right? I mean, sometimes it gets fancy. Maybe, maybe if we're, you know, if maybe there's some neural, if we were really lucky, I mean, my, my team is always begging me, like, can they find a problem where they could use, you know, proper machine learning and some neural nets and, you know, some other stuff. And unfortunately, like most of the time, it isn't necessary. 
maybe we'll get there. But the point I kind of get back, and I want to tell you on, in this context a story, um, because machines are really good. And the other thing I want to say is that machines are a lot better than humans at making decisions in many cases. And I want to start actually by telling you a real story about that to illustrate my point, which is um, people wanted to look at how can doc, you know, how do we predict cancer, and particularly stomach cancer. And they were just they were psychologists, and they just wanted to understand human beings. They weren't even trying to build a prediction algorithm. They just wanted to understand how do humans make decisions. And so they got a bunch of uh, oncologists together, cancer doctors together, and they said, okay, let's study, let's look at stomach cancer and how you diagnose the likelihood someone's got a stomach cancer. And what they do is they take an x-ray of your stomach and they look and there's maybe a little, um, a little tumor and the question is, is it benign or is it, or is it cancer? And they look at certain, they ask the doctor, you know, how do you decide? And they say, well, we look at the size of it. We look at whether it's growing. We look at whether the edges of it are irregular. Uh, and these, there's kind of seven features. And so this, they, they said, okay, well, let's try and build a really simple model. We'll just put those seven features together. And they're either a, a kind of a plus or a minus. They're either going the right direction. We'll just add them up to make a prediction. And then the other thing they did is they went and surveyed. They got 100 x-rays, and they went to eight doctors, and they had all the doctors evaluate those, those cancer images and, about whether it, and, they, and they knew also whether it was cancer or not. And the other thing they did was they were smart scientists, so they, they took an extra copy of all of the scans. They, they duplicated all of those scans, and then they mixed them up. So every doctor would rate the same scan twice, just as a double check, right? Now, here's the kicker of this story. What did they find? So first of all, every doctor contradicted themselves at least once. So every doctor diagnosed the same scan, like exactly the same scan, differently. Once as cancer and once as not cancer, at least once in the hundred ones. Many of them did it set many times. In addition, the agreement amongst these oncologist experts was really low. Like, I'd go to this gentleman over here, he'd say, oh my God, Rufus, you need to go to the hospital right away, get that taken out, and then I'd go to this next gentleman, he'd say, you're fine, right? Which is kind of worrying, right? And the really interesting fact is, let's say you take all the doctors together, the wisdom of crowds, and you average them. Or you even take the best doctor, the doctor that came up with the best answer, and the basic algorithm outperformed them on diagnosis. Now, here's the question to you guys. When was that study done? Do you think it was done in the last, who thinks it was done in the last 10 years? And everyone has to put their hand up at one point in this exercise, I'm just telling you, okay? So just, put, just check your arms are working, okay? I want everyone to put their arms up right now, just to check you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah, come on, just everyone put their arms up, okay. Yeah, that arms up, arms up, great. Now, who thought the study was done in the last 10 years? Okay, great. Who thought it was done in the last, like the 10 years before that? So like 2000, 2010. Who thinks it was done in the 1990s? Who thinks it was done before that? So that study was done in 1968. That study was done in 1968 and published in 1968. There is a huge set of evidence that now shows that basic when you have the data, so remember here, we do need the seven factors. Once you're collecting those, basically, basic algorithms, I mean, this wasn't even a proper regression. This was just a weighted sum, right? It wasn't even a regression with weights, right? Outperform humans. Now, that's, because, that's not because humans are dumb. I mean, humans are just really good at doing lots of other things, like driving cars. I mean, I know maybe we'll have, we'll have cars, we'll have self-driving cars, maybe. But... You know, driving cars, having conversations, building complex social relationships, etc. We aren't very good at making decisions like this for a variety of reasons. I mean, and I'm, I'm not going to go into all of those today, but just one I would like to point out is that if you know, do you know something about humans? Humans can actually only count to seven, right? If you don't have, a, if you don't have language and you can't count with your fingers or with numbers in your head, you can actually only count to seven. Like if I throw like just some, di uh, some like stones on the floor and I say, before you can count, just like how many are there, up to about seven, you'll be accurate. That's what you can count to just like in your brain without a language system, without a tally system. 
You're better than sheep. Sheep can count to three. I grew up on a farm, right? If a sheep has more than four lambs, it doesn't know when it loses a lamb. It can't tell that it, a lamb has gone missing. And in fact, that's why humans invented numbers. We're pretty certain that humans invented numbers because they used to have to count animals to check they hadn't lost animals. The earliest number counting are sticks with lines on them that people would go along with their finger to check whether they'd lost sheep. Now, humans are just bad at counting, but machines are really good at it. That's a quite important when you're doing data-driven analysis. Now, I want to come back. Why am I telling you all of this? So, there's actually quite easy for us to get better at predicting and making decisions in a whole bunch of areas, right? Like, it's, it's actually really straightforward because we're pretty bad at making decisions. We're bad at predicting outcomes of elections, sports games. I mean, the study I just told you has been replicated now hundreds of times in everything from betting on football matches to political races to predicting the students. Like, I, I, I taught at the University of Cambridge. I had to sit there interviewing students saying, are you going to get to come to Cambridge or are you not? Now, when I started reading this research, which unfortunately after I was kind of doing some of this, I discovered just how bad, you know, it's actually probably better for you not to meet interviewees face to face. It actually biases you more than it gives you information, for example, often. Um, and for example, we have human biases. You like big people. If you meet a big person, you're more likely to like them and be charmed by them than if you meet a little person because of how we're hardwired from our evolutionary ancestors. There's a whole bunch of biases. Now, what I'm saying is, all we need to do is get some data and do some basic algorithms. We could get better at predicting traffic, planning. I mean, we're already doing some of this. Now, the kicker in that story, right, was that humans had come up with these factors and they had collected all this data that allowed them, you know, they'd spent probably 100 years developing x-ray machines, uh, knowing what to look for in the cancer scan, collecting the relevant data. It still took a human at that point to code the data to put it in the algorithm. Now, the similar point is we can do a lot in cities or elsewhere with data, but we do need to have the data and to collect it together in a way that you can combine. And in a lot of the predictive analytics work I've done, as I said, from really big companies down to really small ones, or just general data insight projects, as I would like to call them, the big challenge is getting the data. Even when you have your fancy algorithms, even when it is hardcore machine learning. I mean, just take, for example, does anyone know the Google, Google's Go success? But just think about one thing about Google's Go success. To train that algorithm, they needed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Go games that had been recorded somewhere. They couldn't have trained the machine without that. So what I would say in a lot of the projects that we see and what I'm, I'm really focused on is how can we have more frictionless data flow? How can we have data flowing to where it is needed, to the people who can use it to generate insight, to the algorithms that we need with l much less friction? Because as I said, my rule of thumb when I come and do an insight project with someone because that's really the only reason you want data, right? You don't want no one sits and says, I just want more data. More data in my, you know, in my, in my data warehouse. I mean, ma maybe some people say that, actually. I don't know. You know. They sit there at night counting the bits. But you know, really, you want it for insight. But when you look back on those projects, my rule of thumb is like 80 to 90% of the effort are often is data collection and, ag and, and integration. And then you get to do the insight. And that's what is in the way at the moment for us in accelerating time to insight. It's reducing friction in the ecosystem. And that, coming back to next year, is part of it. You know, there's all of these different sources, but let's say you want to just go somewhere and find all the data, all the satellite, all the sensing imagery related to crops in Belgium. Right now, that's, you know, just even finding whether it's out there or exists is some task that could take you w maybe weeks of Googling around, searching, asking people. What things like NextGeos Geos are doing, or what we're generally seeking to do when we're building data projects with people, data integration, data management projects, is massively reducing that time to discovery and time to having your data integrated. That's what we want to do. We want a frictionless data ecosystem, which then starts taking us to us to a frictionless insight system. So the summary of the talk is 
there is a huge amount of potential. Partly because, not because humans are bad, but we're pretty lousy predictive decision makers or model builders. We've got biases, we've got heuristics. I mean, my favorite one I also didn't show you is we get tired. Unfortunately, I have the graph up. There's a great graph of judges making decisions before and after lunch, right? They go, they're making parole decisions before lunch. Before, at the start of the day, they grant 70% of parole decisions. You get parole if you go up in front of them. Before lunch, it's dropped to 5%. If you go in front of the judge at just before lunchtime, you've got a 1 in 20 chance of getting parole, just because they got tired and hungry. Humans are just not great decision makers in this way. So there's huge potential in combining data with even basic models, let alone more sophisticated ones, to improve the design of our cities, uh, our government policies, uh, our businesses. However, what is mainly in the way is good quality data available and integrated. And that is, it's like, it's like the plumbing of this system. It's what makes the city work, right? Without plumbing and sewage, cities don't work. But you don't think about them very much. What you think about is the running water. So that's the plumbing is crucial to us having better, uh, better kind of insight into our smart cities and building smarter cities. And part of it, I would say, is friction. So we're building all these sensor systems. And that's my other point I want to say is we're building all these systems, but often they're stuck in silos. Often we end up with data stuck in silos. Maybe it's proprietary. Maybe it's with particular formats. What's crucial is we start building for frictionless integration from the beginning, and we build projects that allow us to integrate and combine data sets together. And as I said, next year we start, you can think of discovery as the steps, acquisition and integration, and each of those steps along the way. Next year is more focused on discovery, because right now there's this huge amount. You know, like something like 2,000 data sets get published a day onto next year's platform in terms of satellite imagery data sets. And now it's a one-stop shop where you can go find that data and use it for applications. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rufus, for your talk. So reduce uh, friction in the ecosystem. Acquire, uh, acquire data, but also use those data. Th those data. So, uh, not only analysis, uh, paralysis, but also action. Right. Um, now, our next speaker uh, is uh, Miss uh, Gayatri um, Singh. She's a senior urban development specialist uh, in the World Bank with 15 years of experience across Asia and Africa. In her current role, uh, Gaia enables governments to create inclusive and sustainable uh, cities through cutting-edge uh, technical assistance and investments. Um, Gayatri will speak about her experience in three Indonesian uh, cities and how city planning labs approach uh, combined with uh, technologies and applied to municipal uh, spatial data infrastructure is able to improve the quality of life in different communities of Indonesia. So please uh, help me welcome uh, Gaia. Gayatri, sorry. Thank you, Gayatri. Hi, everyone. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah. Um, before I start, can I just get a show of hands of how many people here work in middle uh, or low income countries or live or are from, from middle or low income countries? Okay, some. Um, it, I'm, so I'm going to take you to a slightly different journey. Um, are the slides going to be up? Thank you. So I'm going to take you to a slightly different uh, journey. Um, I think uh, building off on Rufus's talk, I think you'll find there are places where um, uh, uh, there are overlaps and then there are places where I want to broaden our minds to kind of move away from thinking about smart or data, uh, but to more messy, uh, to more um, what, what, what is at the foundation? What's, what's ticking behind the machines that may make or break uh, smart cities? Um, uh, and I can, uh, let me start talking and um, while this comes up. So um, I, uh, uh, the, I'm going to present on City Planning Labs. It's a technical assistance initiative uh, in Indonesia. 
uh, we are in the process of scaling up to from our cities within Indonesia as well as outside. Um, and, and I think it's a really interesting time and, and it's, um, am, can I, I can use this, yeah. So, um, so let me start with the story. A few years ago when I started working on this, um, um, the city planning labs, it wasn't, it's not a physical lab. We actually don't have a place in the city. It's a way to think about experimenting with different models of governance that work, what works uh, with respect to data, what makes cities do more evidence-driven planning, evidence-driven decision-making. Um, now, a few years ago when I started, we went to a few cities who showed interest in this in Indonesia. So one of the cities we went to, high capacity city, had this beautiful, fancy, um, wha what they call the war room, or rather the control room, what you may know, but it's beautiful screens, awesome state of the art facilities, very impressive. And they could like, you, you had cameras, you could see all the garbage trucks moving. They were like garbage trucks stopping and the, um, the, the city planners were pointing out, see, there is traffic congestion because we can see they're stopped over there. Turned out it was a broken API, but never mind about that. Um, but what they, what they were really struggling with was that uh, they had built this beautiful front end, but at the back end, there was no data to really analyze. Like they, they had stuff that they could see, it's beautiful visualizations, but they had also spent all their money while they were building this uh, beautiful infrastructure in not really figuring out what, where the data sat. They had a firm whose maintenance contract had run out. They had gone to different agencies, collected data, and now they, they, their firm was not there. The agencies were not sharing data, so everything they had was outdated. So essentially, the mayor had said, quix it and fix it in about two months. If you don't fix it, you're gonna lose your jobs. Um, now, unfortunately, we couldn't necessarily save their jobs because I was like, we're not gonna take this on in two months. There is no way to turn this exactly around with what you really want to see a sustainable model. However, that got us, um, got us to a place where we're like, this studio, this lab, just focusing on the fancy front end doesn't work because we cannot, uh, 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 we, uh, we cannot manage what we don't measure. And now this was an important message for us at that time because the focus was that the data simply was not there to do evidence-led decision-making. And when it was not there in a high-capacity city in a form that could be used, it was certainly not going to be there in medium to low-capacity cities. So now when we arrived at this point of, uh, of uh, 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 a few years ago, the Economist eventually caught up with us and is now where they were talking about data uh, is to the century was what oil was to the last one. And the importance of data has, uh, is, is being talked about a lot. But I wish I could just say we had figured it out. Data was the big, big issue. We go went to the cities, we fixed it. We, tr you know, and there's all these ways of fixing data. Um, you could start from scratch, you could invest in it. But um, unfortunately, um, there, that was not our happy ending. So as city planning labs started engaging and as I, I promised you messy story, so this is another one of our secondary cities where we, we would follow up with them. We would say, can we come? Can we discuss? I mean, mind you, this is a grant. This is not something that's costing the city and maybe that was part of the problem. Um, and the city has a lot of data and they kept saying, but we have a lot of data. W what, what's the problem? Like, wh what is, what's your issue? Why do you want to talk about it? But when we started looking at them, uh, uh, there was no data management. The, the same issues that created problems, the quality of data was, was really poor. So if you looked at a shape file, it would have no attributes. You couldn't tell whether it was from 1990s or whether it was from 2015. And there's nothing you can do in terms of planning over time if you don't have that good stuff. Um, and, and the more we talked about it, we realized we were talking to the city planning agency whose mandate was coordination. But unfortunately, for them, coordination meant just kind of, you know, go, going with aggregating materials, having meetings, bringing people occasionally together when it was time to make a spatial plan or some decisions. But they didn't see each other as leaders in 
really br taking the city towards a smart city vision. And ha it, it so happened that they were working on a smart city vision and the challenges that the smart city um, and smart city, mind you, was in the ICT department. So that was facing a whole other set of challenges because nobody want, thought that ICT should lead it, but then ICT department was leading it. So the spatial planners said, well, we don't want to work with you. So there was like all these dynamics and we were like, whoa, I mean, we thought data was going to solve it. At the same time, we were bringing to them these um, really interesting data sets, like a networked land subsidence, uh, a terrain model, which told you how the impact on network infrastructure from land subsidence can really um, impact your planning of infrastructure. So for instance, they have about 10 to 12 centimeter land subsidence issues, but they continue to build on that. Now, these models were really exciting for them, but when we would go after six months, another agency had developed the same data set. So Tremendous duplication, tremendous duplication, no data sharing. So as we kept working through it, these were four challenges that we were like, we just can't move forward. Data is not fixing it. Um, one of the, the first one that was the lack of uh, data governance framework. I am pretty sure this is a problem in a lot of places, but lack of data protocols, lack of data standards, lack of relationships between uh, different agencies. So somebody yesterday told me, well, you know, maybe Indonesia is just like a very, uh, people need to be collaborating and discussions, but in a top-down place, it's no problem. I mean, I really beg to differ. Without clarity in who works with whom and when, who is responsible for taking you, your data every six months, giving it to another agency, just the thing, the, it simply does not work and the institutional silos just co uh, continue to persist. The second challenge was the absence of fundamental data sets. So one of the things that we did when we first entered our participating cities was to do a data inventory. A simple mapping, self-assessment, diagnostic of where is your data, guys? Whose laptop is it on? Is it paper? Is it shapefile? Um, and when was it created? Like super simple Excel spreadsheet. We have it on offer if anybody wants it. Um, and what we found out there was a couple of things. One, in one city there were abo about 24 really important data sets that were sitting with consultants. And one of the consultants had actually taken the data to his grave because he had died and nobody had a copy of the shapefile. I mean, these, these are real challenges. You, you have cities where, and the data that he had disappeared with, um, I mean, not his fault, but um, was the city's uh, entire uh, spatial plan. And they really were at a loss. There was a lot of money sunk into it. The firm didn't know where it was. They, the, as the, because the city did not have the capacity, because the people did not have the awareness of what, what, what are the terms of reference, what should I put in the bidding document, what should I put in the terms of reference, this kind of information kept getting lost. Uh, there were other things like um, we identified one of the products we do is uh, fundamental data sets. And the fundamental data sets are your building block data sets, the ones on which, which can be combined, which other analysis can build on. So those fundamental data sets, one of the city has about 231 data sets. But of the 56 fundamental data sets they need, they only have 23. So this is tremendous loss of inefficiency. And of course, there are no data sharing platforms. There are data visualization platforms. But the city often doesn't understand the difference between visualization and data sharing. And that tends to create problems. So our bottom line was that, look, these band-aid solutions that we keep coming up with, whether it's technological, whether it's just data, is not going to work. And being coming from the World Bank and having the mandate to have uh, good access to the government, being able to speak to the policymakers, being able to have a dialogue and convene different stakeholders, it was simply not acceptable. But unfortunately, what's also not acceptable in our big organizations is to take a pause to take a self-critical approach and say, look guys, we've spent a year doing this, we've one thing to another, it's simply not working. It was almost like there was a lot of questions asked why we are stopping. But what we ended up doing was to take a really a deep dive. These are just the peppering of um, cases that we looked at. There were a lot of other cases we looked at, but trying to figure out not just what worked in terms of technology or data, but what was it that made it work? What was the process? So when we started talking to different 
countries, different policy makers, and Singapore Land Authority because everybody thinks that Singapore has it all figured out. The top-down approach works, the president says you do it and you do it, it doesn't. And last 10 years has been their journey of how to make different agencies collaborate, work together, and create a public-facing platform and an internal agency-facing platform, which has been a very interesting journey for them. So we are very grateful to all these people and governments who shared um, uh, their failures as well as successes. And, and based on that, we've developed this, pro well, our process-oriented product, so to speak, uh, Municipal Spatial Data Infrastructure, or MSDI. Um, often you think, uh, you hear about spatial data infrastructure at the national level. You don't hear about it at the municipal level, but we feel that the place where it can make a real tangible difference, where it can solve some of these bottlenecks is at the municipal level as well. So, but what is MSDI? Uh, when I say municipal spatial data infrastructure and I start saying this and then there is translation in Bahasa Indonesia, by the end of it, I've lost the audiences. And one of the people in one of the cities we work in said, well, this MSDI is like a scary ghost. I mean, this is a direct quote. So we had to kind of, I wanna make sure that, and in this conference as well, when I've talked about it, people have said, oh, so you mean infrastructure, hardware, software, why do you call it infrastructure if it's not just about that? Well. Thinking about data as infrastructure is thinking, uh, uh, let, let me, we don't think, when we talk about roads, we don't, just don't think about the tarmac or we don't think about the physical aspect we see. I mean, maybe we do, but we probably shouldn't or any other infrastructure. So for example, for a road network to function, you need rules and regulations. You, need, you don't drink and drive. Don't text and drive. You need protocols. You need certain behaviors that are regulated and mandated. And when that happens, you get a nicely functioning, everybody knows what to do, it's, it's predictable. Um, uh, you also need people, workers who know how to repair roads, keep them in, in a decent shape. You, people with skills and capacity to, to maintain this uh, road infrastructure. You also need um, data utilization. I mean, whether that's your algorithms for uh, traffic modeling, whether it is to predict um, what the bottlenecks are. You need, some, you need the capacity to utilize it, and you need the systems to utilize it. But in terms of systems, a single road segment has no power. Road, seg road networks have power when they exist as networks. In the same way, data has power when it exists as a network of data sets when it builds upon each other. So think, keeping this thinking in mind of data as infrastructure, what we have developed is, um, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but we have uh, materials and uh, well, we're happy to share it, uh, a roadmap, a four pillar roadmap of interconnected pillar, IPDS, institutions, people, data, and systems. And each one of them ha has a space in the ecosystem of how a city government needs to think about in order to make its smart cities initiative successful, bringing in more innovative data, but turning it into insights. Um, I, I think all of the things that we're talking about, the technological data solutions, they're incredibly valuable, but they have even more power and more sustainability when they exist in an ecosystem where these components are interlinked. Now, this may look like just something that we can, uh, I mean, it's a given, you need institutions, you need people, you need data, you need systems. But what we try to do is to work with the cities to develop a, a roadmap with very concrete, short, medium, and long-term um, commitments and action items and a results framework that they and us can jointly work on and monitor. And this roadmap is highly collaborative. The way to develop this roadmap is bringing all the agencies together. Agencies have to agree. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy when you're used to working in silos, but the behavior changes. Be behavior changes over time. We've seen a change, but what we basically, and these two quotes are not the ones from us. These are the ones that our clients, our counterparts have talked about. Plan big, but start small. And start anywhere, but keep, keep an eye on the eye because without the institutional arrangements, whether you do it in your year one or year two, you've got to build, you've got to build upon that. And what we do, and this is really important, I guess perhaps from the World Bank perspective, but other agencies and other approaches, 
you can have multiple entry points. The IPDS are all my entry points. But if you can't adapt your approach to the reality of the city, and if you want to be highly prescriptive and say, let's do it all, let's start from the beginning, and then we keep going down the list, it's not going to work. So you've got to make, make adaptations to your, to, to, to your model. And so, for example, in the city of Denpasar, uh, which is a real, I mean, you all know of Bali, ba Denpasar is the capital of Bali. Um, they wanted to start with a geo portal, a public facing open data, beautiful. It was great, excellent. But after a year, they realized that nobody was keeping up with the data sharing. Nobody was responsive. When a request came to download the data, who, who to direct it to? I mean, it was open, so they could direct most of it. But then there were data sets they hadn't uploaded yet. So where does that go? So in order to figure that out, they took a step back. And now they're developing a complete MSDI um, uh, uh, mayoral decree with with, ev with uh, where they're regulating. I mean, it's not that they're trying to regulate that you can't move from it, but essentially trying to make sense of how do these things interact with each other, which, is a r which in itself is making them think together as a city and not just as one agency or the other. So I'm, um, uh, I'm going to, um, um, uh, to end on this note, um, and, and I think these are quotes which are from, um, uh, from, the, uh, from the local government. I think uh, there's one more slide. And, but what they say, this collaboration, is a really messy piece. It's really messy because nobody wants to work together. Nobody has the time to work together. So they want some sort of a top-down approach, but link it with a bottom-up approach so the two can work together. And one of the mistakes we made earlier on is to focus on the mayor. I've heard a lot about uh, in this conference where people are talking about leadership. Now, leadership is not just about political leadership. It's not just about the mayors. It's extremely important. But the leadership is at the level of people who work. Leadership is data champions within each agency who n are aware and are able to uh, work with the system. And as one of our clients says, you've got to work with some emotion here because this isn't a technical problem. So. Uh, I'll leave you with this thought, no one solution, not a one-time solution, and the focus that we have is on process and not only the products. The products are important, but the process is equally important. And the piece where we found a real success, um, and leave you with a positive uh, note, is um, in, in one of our cities in Balikpapan, they have taken this entire process and they've converted into an annual budget and a midterm budget process. How are we going to do all this with the money that we have? Thank you. Thank you, Gayatri. I will invite you both to, uh, OK, you're already coming. That's great, to have a seat. Don't take out your microphone. But I will also ask you all to um, have questions through the uh, app of the Smart City Expo. You can go to our session, and on the bottom, there is a, a button, uh, uh, say a blue one, saying ask. So please uh, vote uh, for your question there, or vote for other questions as well. Yeah. So. Um, Great talk. Thank, Thank you. you both for your um, presentation. I think it's, um, um, you know, like within the topic of uh, big data, different kind of approaches, but also different kind of limitations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so um, my, my first question, just to also warm up the, the audience, would be on, on, on the topic of uh, not uh, where can we find the data, but which data. Because uh, we're talking a lot about the fact that we are able to have every time more and more data. And usually we're talking about the quantitative ones, the one that we can measure, the one that we can extract from sensors, or the one that we can really, you know, like transform into values and numbers. Yeah. Now, what about the qualitative ones? What about uh, the fact of uh, trying to see data, especially when we're talking about planning in cities and in different cities in the world? How can we humanize? these data? Or, or how can we overlap quantitative with qualitative ones? So I, Go ahead. I mean, uh, I mean um, so I think there's two, thi two things in your question. I mean, so first of all, um, in the work we do at Viderum and generally do with, with um, cities and governments, I think there has, I, you know, I think there's a real need to move from quantity to quality generally. I mean, I think, um, Having more data sets or just larger doesn't really make a lot of difference if you can't integrate them together. I mean, they can just be sitting there and then they're completely useless. So I think there is just one side. That part is 
that is that is testable. So one of the things I think, I um, mean, I think you're making just data governance. You know, do you have consistent meta, even just consistent metadata? Do you have data sets you've looked at that are integratable? That stuff can start should be now part of the data governance framework you put in. Um, I mean, I don't know. So I think on that front, it's just really to go from data quantity to data quality. I mean, I think the other point I'd make is this is in a different area, but doing work with kind of, for example, consumer companies, obviously they're very, they look a lot at social media. And one of the jokes I've always had is that, you know, some of these companies, you know, I won't name them, but they're like, well, you know, we've got our data center now, and, you know, we've got like 20 million tweets, or we've got like 30 million tweets. Mm -hmm. And the irony is that from, a, from an analyst, that when, I, when you work at the data center, they're like, well, half of 500,000 tweets already gets us as much. It actually gets more painful to work with bigger data for a whole bunch of reasons. And most of the insight we're ever going to get, we'll get at 500,000 tweets. You know, we have enough sample size. So the other point to make is it's kind of what I call is like, the th I like to say kind of the three, the three R's of data, like relevant, kind of right, and kind of like, uh, I, I guess, kind of appropriate, but at the right time. So, you know, also the other aspect sometimes we have is just like, uh, you know, and I've seen it with data portals, you know, and we don't always control what happens with them. We get sometimes build them, but you could go trawling the ocean. And I, I, I think you were saying this. I want to emphasize, we have a process at Videra, and we like to call kind of agile data like you have agile software. So in one of the big breakthroughs in software development was to say, okay, we don't just go and specify what we think we need. We have an agile, iterative process where this, the people who have problems or needs say what they are. You build some software that addresses them. Then you look again, and you go around this loop. And similarly, with sometimes with data, you see people collecting data without any definition of the problem they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And it would be much better to start saying, okay, well, this is our problem. What data, you know, the data inventory, can we match it? And go around a loop in that way. Mm -hmm. And I like to call that kind of agile data process, mm -hmm. where it's kind of problem-driven, it's iterative in, a, and, and in approach, and so on. And I think that's what even the planning model you're describing seems to have a lot of that. Um, yeah, I'll say a couple of things uh, building off on that. Actually, we recently looked at uh, one of the CCAN products where you can integrate it into your data portal and do an analysis of how good is your data. And you can continuously keep doing that. And I think that kind of things to integrate within your systems yeah. is a very quick and easy response uh, where the mayor or whoever can say, it's not just the data, is it good data, is it bad data? Right. But on the other piece of the quality, what I would say uh, from the qualitative data, which yes. I also think that you may have been talking about um, is where, how do we integrate data produced by c citizens, for example, with some of the more statistical quantitative data? Correct. Um, and, uh, and so one of the things that you can integrate as long as you know how to integrate is uh, data produced through collaborative mapping, but can I turn that map into an authoritative map that I can use with very minimal effort? We have yeah. the technology out there. Mm -hmm. We, but what, so we have like um, a few interesting programs in several different countries, which is uh, slum upgrading type of programs. So they collect tremendous amounts of data, yeah. they sometimes on paper, which they really should move on to technology for, but then that data doesn't really match with the interoperability between the city's data and the community data doesn't exist, which is a problem. And the third piece about qualitatively identifying or articulating problems, um, this is a shift that we are moving towards now. So we have working with the cities uh, to establish what we call geo-communities. And the geo-community is essentially a way to mainstream collaborative decision-making. So it's like, I have a flooding problem in this area. Okay, which agencies need to work together? Oh, what data do you contribute? W does the community have some sort of data? But once you have everybody in the same room, which does not happen. I mean, you would think that it happens, but defining problems and then using data to answer them is a pro it, it's a process that needs to be encouraged a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, will, I will bring a question from the audience, um, also because we're becoming a bit short of time. And um, anybody um, that wants to add some more, please do so. So is it really easier to plan a city if we have these vast amounts of data? Does it make it easier, or is it, m or is it more about um, optimization? Is it more about sustainability? Is it necessarily easier than it used to be? <laughs> you uh, uh, you, you take the harder one. You said harder time. <laughs> well, I think I think there was. Well, I want to actually build on something you were saying that was great. So I said in a lot of the projects we do around data, whether it's open data, closed p closed data, is there's kind of legal, social, and technical aspects of what you're doing. And I think what you are emphasizing also really rightly is often the social aspect 
is, is like the hardest part and the biggest part. You know, getting the people to be together. You know, technology is there, but is it going to be used? And, and all of that work of breaking institutional data silos don't just happen because of technology. They happen, and not even people being intentionally so, just the natural aspect. They've got stuff to do. Let me get on with it in my area and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that why I say that is coming back to planning a city. I mean, I mean, one is just so I'm I'm an economist also by background, and you know I'm generally you know with quite quite a fan of the free market. It, the free market it seems to be it has market systems have an incredible balance ability to organize people. So just in the terms of the planning versus organizing, most cities, while we would like to imagine they've all been planned, many of them have just kind of been created by an organic process <laughs> of people doing stuff. Now, I think one of the things that uh, if I were to kind of go on a bit about the open data side, I think one of the really amazing things would be that this, that in a way, traditionally kind of city planning information, even with well-intentioned, was with a well-intentioned bureaucracy mm -hmm. to a large extent. And, you know, I just remember someone even a few years ago, they were in the UK, they were upset where a road was going to get built. It was going to get built through their town. And they were like, I can't get the data which the traffic analysis is built on saying that they should do this. And the software that they even do the analysis on costs 10,000 pounds a year to buy. Right. Why is this, you know, I'm intelligent enough as a citizen that I could at least go and have a discussion and I'm essentially locked out of any participation in that process. So I think one of the things that we could really look at is not only does it give kind of planners in the traditional sense better tools, and those are still tools within a framework where there are many other pressures that drive the building of a city, but I really think that it could be empowering or at least involving a, a much greater portion of people in understanding what's happening and in a role in shaping what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that is very exciting, and you almost were alluding it to the community mapping. People are very excited to map their local area or to get involved in those things, you know, and giving people the tools and having that connect back into the official process I think is, a, is a both exciting and no doubt a challenge, um, and I know from experience, but I think that's one area where I think it really can uh, help significantly in people's decisions. And then mainly the first thing that uh, I guess you can bring into that process that communities can participate is also like um, uh, not only new kind of tools, but also education so that people can understand what those data mean. You have been speaking about the fact of spending so much time and money to visualize <laughs> data that then very little yeah. people could understand. I no? mean, I, I How can I we yeah. educate people? But I think it's, it's it w the two things here. I think we forget, sometimes we start thinking data is an end in itself. Elf. Data is a means to an end. Planning is the end. Uh, pl even planning is not the end. Getting the services to the citizens is to, mm. uh, to the end. Yeah. So you need the planners. You need the way to think about it. You need these tools to do your job better. Now, whether more data can make it better or worse depends on what more data. I mean, now if it's useless data and you just have hordes of data, it's just useless data. So uh, one thing I, I should mention is uh, there's caution to data. Yes. So there is a digital divide out there where often the elites have more access to your Facebook, your e-governance, your complaint mechanisms. If you don't have good data at the and data governance and skills at the city level to analyze the authoritative sources of data, you end up responding to complaints. Yes. Mayors are likely to respond to complaints because they're saying, I'm being responsive to citizen demands. Nothing wrong in that, but there is something to think about how will you use that data and educating both people, as in the citizens, but also the agencies right. to, to integrate the two approaches mm -hmm. is really important. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think that's just perfectly put. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, maybe the summary, you frictionless data for frictionless insight and the ultimate the insight that guides better decisions. And you put it that insight is not just slavish devotion to data, but also it's ultimately for insight. Yeah. And if you could do that with a paper survey and asking 20 people, then you don't, then great, do that. You don't need a big data solution, whatever in between. It's really appropriateness. And I do think that people part, I just cannot agree with uh, you enough on that. I think it's just so central what you were doing and bringing people together. That is also the beginning of, 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 of what you need to have data really integrate and be valuable. And can but I just say last sure. one thing, because it's really important Then this, there's a shift that's happening in the conversation of smart cities, which is really exciting. Two, three, four years ago, this conversation was not happening. And the focus was more on the front end, right? But in this conference alone, there's been a lot of talk about communities, inclusive cities, inclusive meaning getting communities to contribute. But I think, let's not forget the missing middle 
model of the yeah. governance of the the city government so there are programs like cities possible things that we've been seeing a lot i mean um they need to engage with this kind of a messiness and then figure out where they can contribute rather than saying this is my product you figure out how it works for you. I wish cities would always do it, but the capacities may not be there. So it's a responsible private sector investments to be able to think like that. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, the, the very, you know, <laughs> close it just the, the one thing I, I, I just, what you just said so. though, <laughs> made me think, which is, do we really want smart cities or do we want wise cities? Sensible. That's correct. You know, wise <laughs> cities. I, you know, I'd like to go to airports that say, we come to a Congress in 10 years time, it says, welcome to the wise city Congress rather than the smart. You know, it's like, you're, do you want your kid to be wise or smart? I know which one I would want. And I think that's the part of it is you can have all this data or you can have all even this insight, but what are you using it for? What are our priorities? And I think that's the deeper so question. So technology can be the answer, but what is the question anyways? Yeah, it's, it's a means, and that means can be used for, for good or for not so good. Okay. With this, um, we're going to close the first session. I would thank you very much, uh, Gayatri and uh, Rufus. Um, and I welcome you all to do a networking break here inside the room uh, to connect. And then in five minutes, we will be starting with our next thematic panel and our next speakers. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. A great hey. <coughs> Buenos días. Me presento. Yo soy José María Carreras, uh, director de servicios de urbanismo del área metropolitana de Barcelona. Y voy a hacer de moderador de este debate que se va a producir a continuación. En relación al tema del planeamiento urbanístico, en relación a la tecnología de los sistemas de información. El planeamiento urbanístico, cuando se redacta, es un ejercicio técnico con intencionalidades políticas. Pero cuando se aprueba, es un hecho político porque se convierte en una norma jurídica que tiene una influencia directa e indirecta en todos los ciudadanos. Ahora bien, cuando el planeamiento urbanístico se ha aprobado, a continuación se abre una fase en la que se tiene que desarrollar y al mismo tiempo hay que gestionar el día a día de la ciudad material construida. ¿Qué papel tiene la tecnología de los sistemas de información en este proceso? En la fase de redacción del planeamiento tiene un papel muy importante en los trabajos de análisis de la situación para luego po poder tomar las decisiones políticas correspondientes. En la fase posterior a su aprobación, tiene un papel importante en la gestión de la ciudad construida. La, la gestión de la ciudad comporta una infinidad de interacciones entre los distintos departamentos de las administraciones y entre los ciudadanos y las propias administraciones. Estas interacciones se pueden me mecanizar, se pueden racionalizar con ayuda de la tecnología. Pero para que esta tecnología sea eficaz, es necesario que haya una correspondencia entre la generación de los datos ya venga de la propia administración o provenga de los ciudadanos y la estructura administrativa que los tiene que gestionar. Esto tiene una consecuencia. Esto implica cambios en la organización de los trabajos de la propia administración y a veces obliga a hacer cambios en la propia estructura administrativa orgánica. Para que estas reorganizaciones de las administraciones se produzcan, es necesario previamente que los objetivos sean claros 
y que la relación coste-beneficio sea favorable en términos de interés público. A continuación, les presentaremos tres presentaciones de dos empresas que se dedican a la, a la generación de productos de soporte a, a todo este trabajo de las administraciones en relación a los sistemas de información y un consorcio que a, trabaja en la misma línea. Los ponentes que nos acompañarán serán Álvaro, Álvaro Guiche, director general de GB SIC Association, que se encuentra ubicada en Valencia y que se trata de una asociación, de un consorcio de, de empresas uh, privadas conjuntamente con administraciones públicas y universidades que trabajan con uh, software de código uh, libre. A continuación, hablará Laurent Bouillot, presidente de Sirradel, que es una empresa proveedora de servicios de información para las administraciones y para las empresas, que se encuentra ubicada en saint Grégoire, cerca de Rennes, en la Bretaña francesa. Y finalmente hablará Christian Carlson, director of state, local and provincial government sales de la empresa ESRI, ubicada en Boulder, que es un municipio que está tocando a Denver en el estado de Colorado. Sin más preámbulos, invito al señor Álvaro Guiche que eh, tome la palabra eh, y tiene... Gracias, Josep. Buenos días, buen día, good morning a todos y a todas. Bueno, vamos a hablar de, de software libre, es decir, vamos a hablar de libertad. Una pequeña presentación muy rápida. Nosotros somos una asociación de pequeñas y medianas empresas de todo el mundo que colaboran y unen esfuerzos para poder realizar cualquier tipo de proyecto de cualquier envergadura alrededor de todo el mundo. Y bajo esa premisa, bajo ese nuevo modelo de producción, se ha desarrollado una serie de soluciones, de productos, una suite de sistemas de información geográfica en software libre. Como veis ahí, pese a ser relativamente jóvenes, nacimos en el 2012, nuestra tecnología se utiliza en más de 160 países, y hemos trabajado para, más de, para clientes de más de 30, de 30 países, ¿de acuerdo? Algunos reconocimientos que, bueno, eh, dicen algo de nosotros. Por ejemplo, el premio que nos dio el año pasado la Comisión Europea al proyecto de software libre en toda su trayectoria más importante desarrollada en Europa o varios premios también de, de la NASA. Y para que veáis que no es mentira, pues unas fotos. La prueba del delito. Algunas entidades para las que hemos trabajado, la idea de esto es que vierais que estas tecnologías de software libre se aplican a todo tipo de entidades, administración pública, local, regional, nacional, supranacional, empresas privadas, ONGs y para hacer todo tipo de proyectos. Pues ahí tenéis un poco de todo. Proyectos que hicimos, por ejemplo, para el Instituto Lincoln de la Universidad de Nueva York junto a un hábitat para desarrollar el Atlas de Expansión Urbana, que se presentó en Habitat 3, proyectos para petroleras, para eh, eh, emergencias, para gestión municipal, etc. La idea es que conozcáis un poco las herramientas con las que trabajamos y cómo esto se puede aplicar a las Smart Cities, que al final es un poco lo que estamos hablando. Os podría contar todo tipo de proyectos, pero bueno, vamos a centrarnos en ciudades. Las tecnologías que utilizamos normalmente para los proyectos son estas tres. Tenemos una serie de soluciones transversales y luego también tenemos soluciones verticales. Pues tenemos aplicaciones para bomberos, aplicaciones para criminología, aplicaciones para transporte multimodal. 
pero al final todo se basa en estas tres tecnologías, que son el sistema, el JVSIG de esto, que es el, el GIS de escritorio de toda la vida, el que está dedicado a los usuarios más avanzados, donde vamos a encontrar pues, herramientas de edición avanzada, geoprocesamiento, etc. Todos los que hayáis trabajado alguna vez con GIS, sea ArcGIS, sea otro, pues vais a encontrar aquí una réplica en software libre. GVSIC Online, que realmente más que un producto es una plataforma que implementa una serie de componentes para poner en marcha las infraestructuras de datos espaciales. Lo que hablaba la ponente de, de Yakarta. Lo que nos va a permitir organizar toda la información de una organización, publicar luego geoportales o visores de mapas y siempre basado en estándares. Aquí en Europa además tenemos directivas que obligan a toda la administración pública a implantar sus infraestructuras de datos espaciales. Y GBC Mobile, que son aplicaciones, apps para Android, tenemos también para iOS, para eh, tomar datos en campo. Bueno, estas son algunas imágenes para que veáis temas 3D, edición, manejo de tablas, imágenes raster, toma de datos con las aplicaciones móviles. Y al final, los componentes de un GIS son estos. El sistema más completo que podamos imaginar en una organización va a tener estos tres componentes. La base de datos espacial que compone la infraestructura de datos espaciales, en la cual hay una serie de servidores de mapas, geoportales y más componentes. La parte de escritorio para los técnicos más avanzados va a ser el 1% de la organización. El 99% van a trabajar aquí. Y luego, para aquellos que hagan tareas de campo, censos, inventarios, el mobile GIS. Y esta es la equivalencia. Teniendo en cuenta que todo es software libre, ¿y qué significa esto? Significa que no hay precio de licencias. Y aquí simplemente quiero decir que lo de libre o cerrado va a hacer, eh, se refiere a las condiciones de uso, nunca a la calidad del software. Nunca. Todo es software libre, sin precio de licencia, pero lo más importante no es eso. Lo más importante es que nos hace independientes tecnológicamente, soberanos de nuestra tecnología. No hipotecamos nuestro futuro a las políticas comerciales de una única empresa. Trabaja todo con estándares, es integrable entre sí, lógico, lo desarrollamos todo, pero además se integra con cualquier tipo de solución, que esa es una de las tendencias de, de los sistemas de información geográfica. Integrar con sensores, integrar con gestores de expedientes, integrar con business intelligence, integrar con ERPs, integrar con eh, gestores documentales, etcétera. ¿Y por qué esto es importante las infraestructuras de datos espaciales en las ciudades? Porque dicen que más del 80, yo creo que es más del 90, de la información que hay en un municipio ocurre en un lugar, está georreferenciada. Pues el urbanismo, el medio ambiente, la seguridad, las infraestructuras, los niveles socioeconómicos de nuestra población, todo ocurre en algún momento y se puede representar. Y estas soluciones nos van a permitir catalogar, localizar y compartir la información. Estos son los visores de mapas que podemos crear con este tipo de aplicaciones. Lo típico que podéis encontrar, puedes crear geoportales de manera ilimitada, tantos como quieras, con herramientas de edición avanzada, por supuesto si tienes permisos para editar, con plugins como el 4D para manejar datos temporales. Esto se utiliza mucho en ayuntamientos para consultas de catastro cuando hay disputas entre vecinos. ¿Y qué eh, tipo de aplicaciones se pueden hacer en el minuto y medio que me queda? Pues callejeros, todo el tema de urbanismo. Esto que estoy mostrando son todo casos reales de distintos clientes. Urbanismo que se puede enlazar a temas de catastro, por ejemplo, al catastro de España. Movilidad sostenible con transporte multimodal. Accesibilidad urbana, cartografía histórica, medio ambiente, residuos. Y además hacer estudios de reubicación de residuos, patrimonio municipal, industria, criminología. Esto es un proyecto que hicimos para Argentina, en el cual se está estudiando toda la criminología, turismo, el inventario municipal. Y ya para acabar, pues lo que os comentaba, integraciones desde proyectos de software libre de sensores como Sentilo, que nace aquí en el Ayuntamiento de Barcelona, a cualquier otro sistema de información geográfica. Por supuesto, análisis internos, socioeconómicos que podemos hacer y simplemente comentaros que la implementación de todo este tipo de soluciones puede ser como un servicio o instalado en el cliente, teniendo en cuenta siempre que todo es software libre, que no hay ningún coste de licencia ni de mantenimiento posterior y que además se puede implementar en un periodo récord de, de tiempo. 
ahí tenéis el contacto para seguirnos y un poco de rock and roll. Muchas gracias. Merci, eh, Laurent Villot. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Laurent Bouillot, the chairman and CEO of Cyradel. Cyradel is a branch of NG. NG Group is one of the world leading uh, providers of energy and utilities. Today, uh, I would like first quickly to introduce Cyradel. Uh, we focus on how can we provide the best twin digital cities for smart city stakeholders or smart city and then smart city planning. And to, um, to give uh, some uh, concrete uh, presentation, I, I have selected in first a few slides, but I prefer in fact to present you uh, this video. This video is to present you our, our approach. And the first step, as we already discussed, is to be sure we have a very good uh, 3D modelization of cities. This is an example in uh, Ohio State University in the US. Today we have capabilities to modelize sometimes at within five centimeters in 3D. This is the first layer of data. We have to think uh, the, this first layer is absolutely crucial before any aggregation. So that's we focus a lot to produce, to aggregate, and then to be sure we have a good first 3D uh, reflection of data. The second step, this is an example in Santiago in Chile. We have to aggregate and then, for example, here to represent in 3D uh, population density, uh, but also the quality of connectivity. Connectivity is an enabler of smart city and, and, and city in general. So the idea is not only to aggregate data, but also to produce a new data. This is, for example, the energy consuming uh, um, per building crime uh, um, uh, and all data that we can exist. Like that, we can create uh, more than 100 indicators to make a diagnostic of the city. With all this information, as mentioned, we can realize some simulation. This is, for example, here the noise propagation simulation. When we talk about the environment, we also have to think about the air quality, noise pollution, all things who can uh, give us the feeling that we are in good or not in, in good uh, areas. This is an example in Strasbourg. Uh, through the cathedral, the issue is to say, how can we reduce the noise? How can we reduce the air pollution by transforming uh, some roads? So this kind of tool can be very useful for people and stakeholders, not only for engineer to uh, understand uh, things. Because when we talk about urban transformation, one thing important is the time. Because, OK, this is a diagnostic. In 10 years, we will have a nice city. But in the meantime, we have a lot of things, a lot of difficulties. So that's why the communication is absolutely essential to convince people, OK, let's do it. With my R&D team, we, we continue to focus on this point. How can we uh, give things very concrete? I don't know why I don't have the second video. Yeah, OK, <laughs> one thing. So yeah, in, in my company, we, 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 we of course, as you, as you will see, we focus on 3D modernization, 3D simulation. And how can we make things more concrete? This is an example of project we have realized in Paris. So all our 3D data uh, will be printed, uh, be has been printed in 3D, and then with different uh, uh, tools and, 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 and projector, we can represent in 3D concrete things. The first layer of information important is the IoT. We, we don't talk so much about 5G, for example, but I'm, 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 sorry, I'm 
I'm totally convinced that connectivity is really an, an enabler to facilitate how can we combine information. This is, for example, uh, for energy application, how can we imagine to install new photovoltaic panel directly in interactive tool? It's not static. Digital is not static. It's uh, something that we have to, uh, to, uh, to interact and then to be inside the virtual cities, the digital twin, the copy of the cities. So this is a few examples of information, not only to calculate, to represent, but also uh, to use and combine by all, not only by engineer, but also by citizen. This, this kind of application is used by, by citizen. In this case, for example, it was around the Pantheon. How can we reduce the heat Iceland, uh, considering more vegetation? Smart city, safe city, that's absolutely crucial to think about what about the quality of, of the feeling of the, the, the safety. And the end one is attractiveness. With tool, we can give to people capabilities to, in fact, to, uh, to select what are the key indicators for each people. Then, for example, we can say, I like to be close to uh, um, um, shopping mall, etc. Then you can have a map, a new map, in face with your own uh, interest. That's very interesting to also uh, to know that uh, GPS, as you know, in the city, the quality of GPS is not so good. Sometimes we say, okay, we have this information close to you, and tomorrow with autonomous vehicle, one issue is uh, GPS connection. So a lot of research around the quality of the geolocation. So you see, this is a few uh, examples of how can we, I say, come back to the concrete world and combining uh, digital and concrete world. So we, 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 we like to, in fact, to co-construct this kind of tools, not only together between engineers, but more and more with citizens are very involved to see how can we, can, we, can we do that all together. So this is an optimistic <laughs> point to say, thanks to all these tools, we can imagine to, uh, to create a city of tomorrow. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. Good morning. All right, good to see you. My name is Christian Carlson, and I'm with Esri. Um, I've been, I've been a, I'm a geographer. I've been a geographer working with cities for 25 years, um, applying geography to the work that cities do. And I, I, I don't want to start the presentation without saying thank you to you for the work that you do. I'm fascinated by the work that architects and planners and GIS professionals do to support livable, um, sustainable, smart, and now I learned wise cities everywhere. Um, it's, it's incredible work and it's been my pleasure to apply geography and the tools of geography to the work that you do and help, help bridge that gap with you. I'm going to do a couple things in my limited eight minutes today. I'm going to, I've got three major objectives. Number one, I want to emphasize that using geography as a framework for communication and collaboration, it's a, it's a favored and impactful framework for just understanding information and, and, and gaining knowledge. Number two, it's a catalytic technology with respect to creating collaboration opportunities. We've heard about this a lot this week at the conference, the importance of collaborating and communicating across governmental silos using geography and maps as a way to communicate information actually facilitates that process. And lastly, the use of geography as a framework to, 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 to present information can also be catalytic in driving work and activity, which is, which is the end result in, in what we actually want to happen. It's understanding data, it's collaborating with each other, and driving work activity. So one of the things that you'll see, this is a sort of a an image or a slide that we have used for years and years. It, this, this actually reflects every city has the same aspirations. We all want to be healthy, we want to be safe, 
We want to be sustainable. Th these are common aspirations that, that every city is striving for. The challenges and the barriers that are in the way of achieving these things are common across cities as well, but they also can be unique. But these aspirations are common. There's a lot of talk about technology. Obviously, it makes sense. We're at a time where there's massive technical revolution. There's, there, there is a, a, a complete um, replacement of government business systems with current technology that is resulting in this digital transformation of the way that governments do work. But I don't think enough attention is placed on ensuring that these aspirations that we just described can be actually connected to the initiatives that make them a reality. So it's not just about talking about technology, whether it's sensors or whether it's GIS or it's machine learning or artificial intelligence, but it's actually being able to connect that technology to the initiatives that drive to those very specific aspirations that we all have. And so the first point is, how is GIS an impactful tool for communicating the problem and creating understanding? I believe that it is probably the most effective tool. I'm going to show you an example. This is, as you may know, we have, a, we have an opiate challenge in the United States, an opiate addiction challenge. What you see on the screen is binary numerical data that reflects data about this challenge from 2016. I just want you to take just a second and sort of absorb what's on that screen. This next slide is an image of a community in the United States. Each red dot on this map is an accidental overdose that took place over the course of 18 months. So think about this again. Numbers and then a visual from a community. I think you can see, to me, that map and that presentation of the data is extremely impactful. And it changes the way that I think about this issue. By the same token, analytical models where you can stack information and gain a better understanding about a challenge. In this case, this is a um, stress index. It's a series of data that is combined to identify areas of vulnerable populations. So areas of drug crime, areas that fail to have uh, recreational resources, um, um, no high school diploma, access to fresh food. It all consolidates to create a stress index that would allow planners and policymakers determine where we can put programs and infrastructure in place to support these at-risk individuals. None of this happens in a vacuum. No one department works on these challenges. We all know that if we're going to tackle mobility, if we're going to tackle um, any type of transportation issue or planning issue, it requires collaboration not only across departments and agencies within an organization, but also the involvement of external organizations, NGOs, um, citizens, universities, private sector. GIS can be catalytic in this nature. One of the things that we have done and implemented in governments all over the world is this concept of a geohub. We've actually saw some of that in earlier presentations today, where it's not just open data, it's not just providing access to data, but actually providing access to applications and presentation materials that allow you to understand the information that you're looking at. So for governments to tell their own narrative, to control their own narrative, to explain, here's the challenge, here's the steps we're taking to mitigate, here's the, here, here's the results of that action. But having these sort of comprehensive um, geo portals or hubs of information is, cattle, is, is a favored approach to just plain open data. In, in the government space. By the same token, providing tools that allow you to include your citizens through a lot of different ways, but one way that is interesting is to allow the citizens to be a They're their own sensor. They're out collecting data for the community. Example, this is going in and out, I apologize. This is an example of where citizens have been out collecting examples of blighted neighborhoods, blighted homes for neighbor, to identify neighborhood decline. The next step and last step in my last minute and 30 seconds here is this notion around driving action or solutions. So you collect the data, you collaborate, you share, but then you analyze it. In this case, this is a notion of communities have been able to identify 13 or 14 essential human elements that must exist within a neighborhood, within a 20-minute walk in order for that neighborhood to be viable. 
creating a map that is, demonstrates where those gaps exist in those communities, and then driving, again, policy and work efforts on the government level to locate grocery stores or rec centers for youth, et cetera, that would help maintain a vibrant community, help stop neighborhood decline, et cetera. But it drives action. Um, lastly, around the planning sort of domain, is this notion of collaborative and immersive um, planning solutions. We are releasing a solution called ArcGIS Urban that allows planning departments to work in a collaborative um, scenario-based design environment for their long and short-range planning strategies. This involves multiple people collaborating across departments, including citizen input, but using geography as the context for those things. So this is the continuum that I see. I touched on three major portions of this continuum, but using ge geography and GIS as a way to collect and maintain and curate data, and then carrying it all the way through the life cycle into driving decisions and, and, and action within a government. Thank you very much. Gracias. Bien, ahora... Vamos a hacer un pequeño debate. Uh, yo antes de nada quería plantear una pregunta a los tres ponentes. Porque los tres ponentes habéis uh, mostrado un poco las capacidades de vuestros productos. Y en cualquier caso, al ser uh, productos de vinculados a sistemas de información <coughs> geográfica, tienen una componente de base <coughs> que es imprescindible para poder construir cualquiera de estos productos, que es la cartografía. La cartografía uh, puede ser de muchos tipos y, uh, y cada uno de los tipos de cartografía da unas oportunidades de explotación, de análisis, etcétera, etcétera. ¿no? Uh, este es un factor que eh, yo creo que en estos momentos está bastante asumido como un factor clave, pero que hace, yo recuerdo, unos 20 años, cuando aquí en España se empezaron a introducir los sistemas de información geográfico, era un factor que muchas empresas... Mm, te vendían el producto, pero no te hablaban de la cartografía. Entonces, yo querría que un poco hicierais una pequeña reflexión de uh, qué representa las bases cartográficas disponibles, porque el producto de cada una de sus empresas será aplicable pues, dependiendo de estas bases, qué, qué condicionantes representan esto eh, en base a vuestro experiencia como empresas que habéis proveído de, de instrumentos de gestión y de planificación a las administraciones. Empiezas el señor Álvaro Guich. Gracias. Bueno, eh, Josep, tienes toda la razón. El sí. tema de, de los datos sí. ha, cambiado, ha cambiado totalmente. En los últimos años nosotros nos encontramos con muchos ayuntamientos que creen que no tienen datos. Cuando hoy día hay cartografía de callejero a nivel mundial de proyectos como OpenStreetMap de libre uso, que probablemente sea la cartografía más completa del planeta, tenemos datos de imágenes como los del proyecto Copernicus de Sentinel que nos están dando muchísima información todos los días de satélite. Tenemos proyectos nacionales como Cartociudad, que es un callejero en continuo de toda España, o el Plan Nacional de Ortofoto Aérea, ambos proyectos hechos en, en colaboración con todas las comunidades autónomas. Con lo cual, el problema de los datos de base no está. Eso por no hablar de la propia información que tiene cada, cada ayuntamiento y que muchas veces no es consciente, desde el Plan General de Ordenación Urbana a todos los inventarios que pueda tener. Yo siempre creo que esto ha sido una dinámica que va a ir a más, el tema de, de los datos abiertos, que junto al, al software abierto es lo que nos da el conocimiento realmente de, de nuestro territorio. Sí. Uh, no, I can go. sí, Mr. Carson. Oh, sorry. Is that okay? 
No, no. Yes, right? yes. Sure. Mr. Senator Carson. Yes. Yeah, so, as you mentioned, um, early in the evolution of geographic information systems, it was prim these systems were primar primarily managed and operated by GIS professionals, people that were, were trained in a trade and un under understood the elements of cartography, etc. As geography um, become and location become and are pervasive across all, all types of users, you know, what you're seeing is you're seeing the technology take advantage of, of, of um, let me stop and say, th there are 10 pillars of innovation that every platform company in the world that you see in that room over there is taking advantage of when they build their technology. It ranges from IoT to cloud to machine learning to AI, and one of those elements is, is what I would describe as the automation of knowledge work. So what you're, what you're seeing in technologies today is things that used to be difficult and require a trained professional to create cartographically pleasing maps in this case or develop applications, you're starting to see those capabilities being brought into the, the realm of the everyday knowledge worker. And so building tools and templates and, 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 and solutions that, that present the data in a variety of ways that anybody can just use. And so that, that to me is, is one of the key elements that's ha happening right now that's driving the pervasiveness of the technolo this technology and others as well. Mr. Yeah, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right, and uh, the half of our business is to produce 3D data for now more than 20 years. And I remember when I started my, my company, uh, I didn't find a good quality of data for my first uh, initial business. It was to design wireless network for mobile operators. And uh, the question for mobile operators is, how does it cost to deploy uh, uh, GSM networks? how many transmitters, where should we put transmitters? And for that, we need in 3D whole cities. And uh, in first, we specify what kind of data we would like to answer to these two questions. And I found no enough quality of data for that. So we start to specify and then we produce. So the first thing is, in the world, uh, with all our experience in more than 100 countries to manipulate or produce data, mm -hmm. there is no enough quality of data. For what? To have a transitional vision of things. This is the second aspect. The quality of the data and the capability to use data for two things. For simulation, for urban planner, and also for communication. That we try to do to have exactly the same referential of data that we can share and use. It's really an issue today. So we work a lot on how can we, we say, produce a digital twin, the copy of the city, and with the first layer is the same 3D data for all. Of course, open source and national project is nice, but for example, in France, we don't have enough quality of data to modelize within uh, five centimeters, 10 centimeters in Sweden. We have that in, for example, in Sweden. But in, in, in if you see in the world, in fact, the quality of the 3D geographical data is an enabler for smart city. Mm -hmm. So uh, more and more people work together to specify, to define, to have the same uh, format to share information but it's not yet stable at this moment, but this is one of the enablers. For example, and an, an example is, if we take the example of the autonomous vehicle, you know, the European Commission say, mm -hmm. we don't want to go forward before uh, we uh, don't solve the issue to have the same referential of data. Imagine if you have an autonomous vehicle with information to geolocate it this vehicle and uh, another information about the infrastructure who have to communicate with this uh, uh, equipment. If they don't have the same referential data, they it, it doesn't work. So mm. that's an, a real issue for for the next step of our smart city. Sí, sí. Um, hay una pregunta en el público que se plantea también abierta para los tres ponentes, que es Esto es 
ahora ir al otro extremo, diríamos, de el, del problema que nos estamos planteando aquí. O sea, yo he planteado el tema de la cartografía, que está en la base. El, en el público alguien pregunta uh, qué pasa con los, los datos libres que están en la red, diríamos, en qué medida uh, el Open Data influye en la capacidad de estos sistemas que ustedes uh, operan con sus instrumentos y en qué medida la no accesibilidad a estas Open Data, o sea que no serían Open, ¿no? la no accesibilidad a los datos que se generan, diríamos, desde las administraciones, por ejemplo, representa un obstáculo en uh, la evolución de estos procesos y, y cuáles deberían ser los límites del Open Data. Bueno, el Open Data como concepto es, va a ser siempre bueno. O sea, algo que pagamos los ciudadanos con nuestros impuestos debe revertir y debe ser accesible a los ciudadanos. Además, hay muchos estudios que demuestran que el Open Data es un motor para la economía. ¿Por qué? Porque empresas como las que estamos aquí sentadas podemos utilizar esos datos para ofrecer servicios con valor añadido. O sea, que, que la funcionalidad está clara. ¿Dónde están los límites? Pues yo creo que los límites van a estar siempre en temas legales de protección de datos. Uh, por ejemplo, pues no, en, es, en, en España, no sé, en otros países, tú no puedes publicar dónde vive una persona. Sí que puedes representar la población por manzanas. Entonces, ahí va a estar los límites en lo que eh, atañe a, a, a la protección de datos. Pero vamos, Open Data cuanto más mejor. Y las administraciones que no están liberando datos, desde abajo también tenemos que presionar para que lo hagan. Uh, señor Carson. Sí, yeah, I, I agree. Sorry. <laughs> I agree that that's with everything he said. What I would add to that is um, in the United States in particular, um, you know, open data is a big, it's a big initiative. At, at the end of the day, what, you, what we found is that um, the, the traffic to those open data sites is not as large as you would think it would be. It, it tends to be a, a very vocal minority that accesses raw government data downloads it and wants to use it. Um, still, it's an, important, it's an important thing and you do it. So, so what I would add is, is that in, a, in addition to having access to raw open data that people can use, private sector citizens, um, I think there's also a need for governments to, since it's their data, to create solutions that communicate to their citizenry the information that they want them to have. I, for example, am not the right person to download crime information, perform my own analysis, and come up with my own conclusions about crime in my community. What, what, so I, I don't do it. What I would appreciate is seeing a simple app that uses that same open data and presents it in a way that I can understand and then maybe interact with my government with questions um, or in, in some other way than, than just accessing the raw data in, in my own, own analysis. So, so that's what I would add. Provide access to open data, hugely important, but then also add windows into um, applications or solutions that use that data to tell a story and communicate. I think, I think we don't have to take uh, this, uh, this point as an issue to continue to, to go on, you know? <laughs> I think open data is an opportunity. If we have the data, it's fine. We have real, real data. If we don't have, we have to create, we say, realistic data. If we don't know exactly that, we have to, to cross this point and to check to say, okay, I have a first idea. And sometimes it's enough to make decision and then to go on. We, we don't have to wait for uh, one administration to say, please, Are you agree to share these data? Sometimes we have to wait for many, many uh, years. I, I have the opportunity to work in, in Moscow, for example, and, and sometimes it's very long 
to have the uh, the rights to use this kind of data. But whatever, sometimes we can say, okay, I don't have this real data because it's sensible, confidential. So how can we imagine to work around and then to go on? Because we don't have to miss the goal. The goal is to have uh, an overview, an inclusive view of your city. Sometimes you have the data, sometimes not. If you don't have, you have to think what could be the realistic data for about this point. Mm. And then you can go on. And, and, and then later you can, you can come back. The other thing is we talk about open data. We, 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 we also have to think about the, the use of the data and the time to use the data. Mm. Uh, you know, for example, in Estonia, they have a very interesting concept where public and private data are potentially all connected. Potentially. It means it's not always all connected. Mm -hmm. And it could be temporarily connected if it makes sense for one specific usage. So I'm convinced that if we say this data, this personal data is very useful to, to decrease the traffic jam, makes sense to share. But the same data uh, doesn't make sense to sense for another application, for marketing application, etc. So it really depends and de driven by the use, uh, the end use with this data. Mm. Sí. Muy bien. Uh, 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 si hay alguna otra pregunta en la sala. dirigida a cualquiera de los ponentes. Sí. Hello, uh, that would be an open question for all the speakers. Uh, where is exact exact connection between the BIM? <coughs> The BIM systems and the GIS systems. Uh, where is the this is going on, uh, towards? Because we are s uh, utilizing uh, building level very advanced BIM systems, but at the time uh, these GIS systems are moving towards a 3D dimension, mm -hmm. as we saw in the three uh, examples here today. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a big area of of growth in the space, and and w we just formed a partnership with Autodesk where we're interoperating with their with their with their BIM model um, as part of our products and and, and their products. So it, it's it's a it's a huge area, and this whole notion of 3D, but then also the indoor space of mapping, like coming inside the building, is is huge. I mean, it's a it's a it's it's one of the next frontiers on the GIS and and, and mapping stage. Yeah, we, we we have at this stage, and we we, we start to integrate more and more uh, beam uh, building information model to our. Team. We talk about team sim beam. Team is territory information model, sit, sim city information model, and beam building information model. The the ecosystem around beam is become more stable. So it, it, it's time to integrate all of this information. But again, what kind of data it's really need when we have to think about at a team level, mm. uh, you, you don't have characteristic of this norm sometimes if you have to think to plan your city. So that's absolutely important to, to select the right data for the right use. And, and don't only focus on how can we uh, have uh, good interoperability with any any things, uh, yep. because uh, if we focus behind the digital, it's always uh, not the the the, 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 the right thing. It's a tool. We have to access data or not, but the data uh, never driven your drive your your business. Sí, bueno, yo Creo que el, el mundo del GIS está en un momento fascinante, con muchos cambios, y uno de ellos es la integración con el BIM. O sea, es algo que va a evolucionar en los próximos años de una manera que ahora no nos imaginamos. Al final son dos maneras de ver 
lo mismo, nada más que trabajando a distintas escalas. Y entra el BIM, entra el, el Gisindor y entran otros conceptos, igual que podríamos hablar por otro lado de Big Data y de otro, otro tipo de Machine Learning que van a influir en la evolución de los sistemas de información geográfica. Muy bien. Uh, se nos está acabando el tiempo. Yo, como no hay más preguntas en la sala, daría esta mesa redonda por terminada. Muchas gracias a todos por su atención y muchas gracias a los ponentes por su esfuerzo en exponer sus ideas. Gracias. Thank you. gracias. Gracias, thank you. Thank you everybody for your participation to the session. Just a very, very quick sum up. We have seen a lot of different approaches of how data can um, radically change the way that we plan our cities. And I think this is something very important to uh, grab from the session. But it's also very important to not uh, forget that we also discussed and saw that data itself is not enough to bring solutions. No, we need to understand um, uh, what is the context of FIT's case. We need to know to do the appropriate questions for uh, data to give us answers and information. We need to be able to share this data with communities by communicating better, but also with the citizens by educating them and by uh, allowing them to be aware of this data themselves so that they can change behaviors or, as, or, or so that they can participate in the different process. And we have also seen that um, we need to deal uh, with data in a way that is not um, tackling only regional scales, but also municipal scales, which is also something that I think uh, could be very uh, relevant to understand when we are working on big scale uh, planning and, 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 and bring this planning closer to the communities and the people. So with this, I want to thank all uh, the speakers and thank you for your attention. I enjoy the rest of the day and um, thank you very much. <laughs>